My name is Alex Soros, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, moderating uh, this panel, um, which um, I think um, is very uh, timely, uh, given um, the fact that there are some uh, little primaries going on in the uh, in the U.S. Um, and. Um, we have a very interesting afternoon with a transatlantic working group. Um, and, um, you know, this is really what um, ECFR can be about, bringing uh, people from around the world together to talk about Europe and, uh, and multilateralism, even in a time when um, it may be uh, dead or dying. Um, but um, we have a very uh, interesting panel. I know that um, this has been marketed in some instances as representative of campaigns. Nobody here is actually working uh, on a campaign, um, so please uh, don't uh, don't attribute that uh, t to anyone. I'll um, introduce uh, well, everybody probably knows um, everyone here, but um, uh, Ben Rhodes, uh, who um, worked under uh, President Obama, um, Sarah Margon, who um, is um, one of the uh, most effective campaigners uh, in Washington for, uh, for Human uh, Rights Watch. Uh, Amanda Sloat, who um, was in the State Department and uh, is now a um, fellow at Brookings. And uh, Jake uh, Sullivan, who wears uh, many hats, uh, but worked for Biden and uh, was um, the head of uh, foreign policy for the Hillary Clinton um, campaign. Um, so, um, three of you um, are um, sort of open Democrats. Uh, we want Sarah to still be able to talk to Republicans, so she can't answer this question. But I, I'm often struck um, when I'm, since I spent a lot of time uh, in Europe, that, you know, there's this view that the Democratic Party is sort of, you know, in disarray. Uh, and, you know, there's a sort of a civil war in the Democratic Party, yet, you know, even when you're in meetings with, you know, Schumer and Pelosi, et cetera, they seem to be very happy about the, the new wave because, you know, it's that that's getting them, that, that you know, propelled uh, Democrats to take back Congress and, um, you know, is where the, the base of the party, uh, base of the party is. Um, do you have anything to say to our European friends who sometimes have this view of the Democratic Party being uh, in, in disarray? So, uh it's, it's easy to see that given that uh, there are some 25 candidates running for president of the United States uh, in the Democratic primary. Tonight and tomorrow night, 10 apiece will be on stage um, debating uh, in the first primary debates. They're doing back-to-back -back nights, 10 candidates each, and five didn't even make the stage. And if you watch those debates, you will see distinctions drawn, but they're pretty thin distinctions at the end of the day. Um, particularly when it comes to foreign policy. I think if, if Hillary Clinton, rather than Donald Trump, had been elected in 2016, there would be a much more um, kind of uh, divisive debate within the Democratic Party about the future of American foreign policy. But because Trump was elected, Basically, all of the Democrats, from Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on the left to uh, folks like Joe Biden, more in the, in the moderate camp, share a common view on allies, on values, on multilateralism, on an engaged American role in the world. Um, and they will all be effectively kind of advocating that view, whether it's on specific crisis issues like Iran or on the transatlantic relationship or on major challenges like climate change. And even on the domestic side, where there are more meaningful differences, those differences, I think, are going to play out basically around a, a kind of set of common aspirations on universal health care, on dealing with climate change, on, on restructuring kind of power in the American economy um, in a pretty technocratic way. There's not a real divide, a, a real fundamental divide of the sort that I think really corroded the Democratic primary in 2016. And then finally, uh, and others can speak to this as well, Donald Trump himself presents this kind of not just unifying force, but unifying imperative, which is um, every candidate is going to feel some amount of um, sort of caution in trying to go too far in attacking other Democrats. 
because uh, the market just is not there in the Democratic voting public um, for that kind of behavior. And so I think you're going to see a more restrained, more civil conversation, even though distinctions will get drawn and people will go after other people. I think it's going to be probably less than you saw from the Republicans in 2016 and less than you saw between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders in 2016. Uh, I, I agree with that. I would just add a couple things. One, I think that, that there is a, a much more progressive strain that's emerging in the Democratic Party, and you saw that particularly in the House elections uh, with people like Andrea Ocasio-Cortez uh, challenging in a primary a longtime Democratic House member and, and advocating uh, for much more left of center policies. Uh, you saw her soon after the election joining a, a group of climate change protesters outside of Pelosi's office, uh, pushing very, very strongly on that. You've seen others threatening to, to primary other Democrats that have been longstanding members as well. Uh, I think Jake is right that the, the primary is likely to be less partisan, less bitter, less divisive than what we saw in the, the last two. Uh, my own sense in the, the Democratic primaries is that part of the debate we're seeing is whether or not we choose a candidate that is gonna be most effective at defeating Trump, or do we choose a candidate that is gonna have the most appealing alternative policy division. Uh, and related to that, there is a divide about whether or not we try and choose a candidate that is going to be more moderate, more centrist, that is likely to peel away some moderate Republicans that may be disaffected with Trump, but concerned about some of the very progressive economic visions that we've seen from candidates like Elizabeth Warren uh, and Bernie Sanders. The opposite side of that is uh, questions about whether or not those moderate Republicans are ever actually going to cross the line, and so whether the better approach is to choose a candidate with the progressive policies that can mobilize and motivate a large part of the more progressive base within the party. Yeah, I, I, um, I tend to, to come down um, where Jake uh, uh, outlined, which is that, uh, you know, from afar, it's easy to see people like Ocasio-Cortez and to create a narrative that there's this big gap in the Democratic Party. When you actually examine what people are putting forward, it's basically the same list of priorities. Frankly, a lot of these debates are more about tactics than about substance. The, the platform of the next Democratic candidate is going to look very similar no matter who it is. Uh, as Jake said, domestically, there will be a, a set of policies around the pursuit of universal health care. Some people may go all the way for a single-payer system. Some people may have a, a, a Medicare buy-in option. The reality is we're not going to have a single-payer system uh, in 2021 if a Democrat wins, so it's the aspiration that is motivating. Same thing on climate change, same thing on addressing uh, inequity and, and, and unfairness and inequality in the economy. Uh, you'll have a, a set of policies that, yes, some of them are more progressive, but in, in reality, they're goals, and whoever is elected president is going to be dealing with uh, likely a Republican Senate or a very narrow Democratic ma majority. So th this is kind of the, the, the debate you have in a primary is often you know, you all agree on something, so you have to find ways to differentiate yourself, but I think the goals are the same. On foreign policy, it's been very interesting to watch. I do think the party has moved uh, somewhat to the left on foreign policy um, from, uh, from even where Hillary would have been uh, had she been elected president. If you look at the, the issues that are being talked about in the primary, number one, there is no appetite anymore for the wars in the Middle East. And what you're hearing from the candidates across the spectrum, by the way, is a desire to legally terminate the authorization for the use of military force from 2001, to bring an end to this chapter legally, uh, and have a new architecture for how we think about terrorism. And that is a shift even from Obama. Uh, Obama called for that aspirationally in 2013, but this is now going to be the platform, I think, of whoever the nominee is. Uh, and that really does change our orientation. Uh, I think if you look at the, the issue that galvanized the most Democrats in Congress in the last year, it was terminating support for the U.S. war in Yemen. Uh, and I think that reflects both an exhaustion with the wars, but also a willingness of the Democratic Party to rethink our relationship with Saudi Arabia in a pretty fundamental way. Um, we in the Obama administration were, were rarely accused of being best friends with the Saudis, but we maintained the basic structure of the relationship and had a lot of disagreements around it. Uh, I think you might see uh, 
the opportunity for, for a lot of these candidates to fundamentally rethink the orientation of the, the United States uh, in that Saudi relationship, in part because what we've seen is this dramatic shift uh, in U.S. policy where Trump has essentially fully outsourced a lot of his worldview to the Saudis, Emiratis, and, and the Netanyahu government in Israel. And that's going to create space for Democrats to draw distance from those governments in a way that they didn't before. I think the issue of Israel, too, will be an interesting one to watch in the course of, of the primary. Uh, as you, you've seen this kind of political merger between Trump and Netanyahu, that also creates some space for Democrats, I think, to draw some differences with the Israeli government in a way that they might not have in the past. And then I think you're just going to see climate change emerging as, as, as it was in the second Obama administration as more of an organizing principle on how Democrats view the world uh, and how they look at their foreign policy. And, and that, too, has been manifest uh, in, in a lot of the comments that have been made uh, by candidates so far. So I think there's a pretty emerging consensus on domestic and foreign policy. There are tactical differences. There are differences in how combative to be. Um, but f frankly, it's a far more a unified party substantively than I thought we were in 2008 when Jake and I were, were uh, on other sides and, and to that, certainly 2016 when, when Bernie was running as an insurgent. It's kind of an amazing moment when, when Ben Rhodes says a lot of the things that I would have said uh, about the upcoming election. But I wanted to just add two important points that I see from my vantage point which is that I think we're also seeing an interesting moment where the Democratic Party is trying to redefine itself in thinking about not just being reactive to President Trump and his campaign, but also in being proactive. What do we stand for as Democrats? And that is nuanced, I think, and it is going to play out in very tactical ways, but it's important over the next 18 months as the Democrats start to take positions on both domestic and foreign issues. The question of Israel, I think, is really gonna play out uh, intensely within the Democratic primary in a lot of ways, and everybody's getting pushed and pulled to different positions. It's not clear yet where they're gonna land, but I think the conservative situation or sort of Bibi's government in Israel creates an opportunity for the Democratic Party to move to the left, as well as the pull from a lot of Americans. But the other thing I think is linking the domestic and the foreign policy issues, which is something very new, and a few of the candidates are starting to do that. The U.S. has always been imperfect when it's engaged on foreign policy. There have been a lot of blemishes, a lot of hypocrisy, and we know that the, counter -terror the war on counterterrorism, uh, excuse me, the war on terrorism has been a really good example of that in a lot of ways. But I think redefining how the U.S. engages overseas is very much going to be linked to what happens at home and what the Democratic candidates try to do domestically and how that plays out overseas. And so many of us who work on foreign policy, which, as you all know, gets a small piece of the larger campaigning are going to be watching for those links because they're important in terms of getting Americans out to vote and getting them to the polls. Very rich uh, comments. I just wanted to, and, and a lot there, uh, but just on the, uh, you know, on the election and on the campaigns, um, you know, is foreign policy going to play, you know, a role in differentiation between, between candidates? And I know we've talked about Democrats, but it seems that the American people uh, are pretty united in not wanting wars, uh, you know, no matter where they're from and in which state they're from. Uh, and I think President Trump knows this um, and, uh, you know, uh, ran on a pretty anti-war uh, ticket. Yeah, there is a funny convergence between Trump's rhetoric on the wars in the Middle East and Democrats' rhetoric on wars in the Middle East. Of course, Trump's record on that, we have more troops in Afghanistan, more troops in Iraq, more troops in Syria, a continued support for the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. Um, and then, of course, um, we're shipping troops by the thousands to the Middle East for a potential conflict with Iran. Um, so I think the answer to your question, Sarah uh, made the important point that domestic policy considerations are paramount when it comes to American elections, except where you're talking about uh, an ongoing conflict. And um, if the United States does end up in a military conflict or confrontation with Iran, which is very possible given the way that each side is positioning right now, I think that is going to play a significant role in the election over the course of the next year. And there will be sharp differences between where President Trump is on that issue and where Democrats are on that issue. I think another, the two others that I would mention, which reinforce Sarah's point about the connection of foreign and domestic, one is China and the question of China, I think, is going to loom in this election, not merely as a kind of question of grand strategy or foreign policy, but as a question of 
uh, public investment in the United States, how we think about ourselves and our future, um, how we think about this challenge from an emerging great power. Uh, and particularly if Donald Trump does strike a trade deal and, and then turns around to the American people and says, see, I can, I can deliver with these guys, I think that's going to end up being a real debate between Democrats and the president. And then the second is that Trump has effectively securitized the immigration issue so that it's no longer a kind of question of regulating the domestic inflow of immigrants, but is now a kind of question about threats to our border from these hordes coming from outside is the way Trump is casting this. I think this will be put in a foreign policy or a national security light and also will be an area where there are sharp distinctions between the president and Democrats. And I, I think President Trump believes he was elected in 2016 on this issue and he believes his reelection lies in continuing to draw a wedge with Democrats on this issue. So I, I believe that, that this is not going to be one of those things where you can say this foreign policy issues are just kind of off to the side as sort of exotic questions that come up occasionally. I think they're gonna be much more at the center of the president's reelection effort, in part because he's not gonna be able to accomplish anything else through his domestic legislative agenda. So playing in the foreign policy space over the next 18 months will be more and more attractive to him. Um, so we're, we're definitely gonna get, get to China. Before we do that, you know, we're, we're here, uh, you know, talk about the transatlantic, um, you know, alliance um, and, um, or lack thereof, but um, you know, and it was very interesting to be at this year's Munich Security Conference, um, where you had the largest, you know, U.S. Uh, U.S. contingent in history, actually. Um, you know, and Joe Biden had recently, you know, said to you know European audience that you know the U.S. Uh, you know um, will be back. Um, you know, so I wonder if you know if if each of you could maybe speak to what you would see being the pillars of a, a you know of a renewed transatlantic um, alliance. And then um, probably you know Jake uh, and uh, and Amanda, since you know you know what the campaigns are doing, maybe you know differentiate with the candidates. You know who would be who's more uh, multilateral uh, in their approach and would, and would be wanting to work with Europe more, and who has a you know a, a different uh, nuanced view. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing I'd say that's important. Um, yeah, where I uh, would probably have a slight amendment to what Joe Biden said, um, as someone who travels a lot. Um, I think we Americans, we Democrats, uh, as well as Republicans, have to understand that part of what has shook the confidence of the world is not just the fact that Donald Trump is president. It's the fact that we elected Donald Trump president, right? And I don't know how to ask all of you to trust us again right away. Um, and I think it's a big mistake for anybody coming into that office to think, oh, you know, we got Trump out, here we are again, we're the United States, we're ready to be allies again. I think we have a much steeper hill to climb in order to restore a baseline of trust and confidence, in part because Trump is eviscerating the architecture of international agreements that the United States helped to build for so long, but also because he represents such a radical, undemocratic force in the United States, uh, and, and the United States put him there. Right, the American electorate put him there. So I think we have a steeper uh, hill to climb in that regard, uh, and it's going to take take a long time to win back uh, trust and credibility. However, I think that Europe and the transatlantic alliance has to be at the center of what we do, and, and for one very simple reason, which is that to me, the, the the defining contest of our time is between this nationalist authoritarian trend and between small d democracy. And in that context, the US-European relationship is actually more important than it has been in a very, very long time. Because unless we can band together, I think, as democracies, uh, unless we can invest in the vibrancy of our own democracies, whether that's in, in Washington or Brussels or uh, across Europe and the United States, then we're gonna get washed over by this authoritarian nationalist trend. And so I think for the United States, this is going to have to mean, one, as Sarah said, being more consistent in the application of our values and more unabashed in challenging undemocratic and authoritarian practices around the world. Um, you know, I, I think if, if, if we believe that the question is whether or not 
democracies can help undergird a rules-based international order or not, then we have to be more consistent in being democracies, uh, just as we need to be invested in the liberal international order. So I, I would like to see the United States and Europe find a way to revitalize values at the center of our approach to the world, and the center of our approach to conflicts, at the center of our approach to different relationships. I also think that that leads to better multilateral outcomes. Uh, if you're pursuing um, values-based approaches to solving problems, you know, I think that leads to how do you create structures for burden sharing, right? And, and yes, we need a, a place for countries that don't share our values to be a part of that. The Paris Accord, I think, offers an interesting model for how you can have an agreement where every single country in the world has to do something, but they're common but differentiated responsibilities. And I think it's going to be important for the United States and Europe, if there's an incoming American president, to try to find projects where we're trying to galvanize collective action in the world again. How are we dealing with migration and displaced persons around the world? That's a project that demands an agreement of a scale of the Paris Agreement, for instance. And so for the United States and Europe to say, we're going to try to do this big thing together. We're going to try to build uh, collective action on how we deal with migration, rather than having a series of ad hoc arrangements around the world to manage different refugee crisis. I think that can build on what was done in Paris to try to do something uh, that is that is uh, truly globalized as well. I, I think there's going to have to be some basic tending of the garden here in terms of reinvesting in the importance and centrality of NATO to how we think about uh, security as well. Um, and, and a little bit less on the lectures about defense spending and a little bit more vision about what NATO needs to be going forward and, and, and what NATO needs to be as a alliance of democratic uh, states as well. Um, and I would I would you know, extend that consistency I talked about to how we look at NATO and how we look at um, countries that are undemocratic in NATO and, and being a little bit more forceful and in, 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 in insisting that it be an alliance of values. So I could go on, I'll stop because I, 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 <laughs> I don't want to go on too long, but I, I do want to say that to me, uh, when you're dealing with China and Russia and uh, 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 this cohort of authoritarians around the world, you know, we know where that leads. That leads to conflict. That leads to disintegration. There's no example in history where it hasn't. And so unless we're ready to say that we're going to have a much more values-based approach to both our own foreign policy, our own democracies at home, and to the transatlantic relationship, you know, I think we risk missing the forest for the trees here. Um, <laughs> the question is going to be whether or not democracies can survive in this authoritarian context or not. And that has to be the center of, of what we do as allies. So, so watch out, Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, think I wanted to uh, tell a really quick story. One of the things I've been doing in Washington over the last two years, I normally engage the U.S. government right on foreign and national security policy pretty consistently, as these guys all know. But one of the things I've been doing is, <laughs> as doors have shut pretty regularly in Washington for me, has been to engage a lot of the foreign embassies, the traditional like-minded embassies. And a recent um, uh, a like-minded ally uh, was getting a new ambassador, and I got a call from the deputy uh, chief of mission, who said, you know, we're trying to think about how to write her speech. We usually talk about, you know, alliances and uh, values, our shared values, and we just don't feel that we can talk about that in the current era. We can't relate to that. We don't want to lie. We, what do you think? Is it okay? And I said, well, I think you can talk about the shared values with the American people. And I think you can talk about shared values with local government or even state government and the aspiration of having shared values. But yeah, I would agree that it's probably not a great moment to talk about shared values with the Trump administration. And so they switched around their speech and actually didn't, didn't talk about that at the federal level. And I think what struck me about that is that there's this real recognition that the transatlantic relationship is much bigger than government to government, that it engages the people of all of these nations we're talking about here. But at the moment, it is really stuck on the absence of that government to government support and, and, and the tensions between sort of how do we engage on questions of security? What does NATO look like? What do these alliances really mean? What are the economic and trade spaces where the US can engage with all these transatlantic nations? And so there is hope in my mind that it's there, that we can go back to it, and I think most of the candidates on the Democratic side see the importance of re-engaging, but it is gonna be an uphill, uphill battle. And you know what the spaces where the US can engage and where the American people can engage, I think need to be, and where civil society can engage, need to be uh, 
those relationships need to be strengthened because we are looking at a fight that is not just US and Europe versus the world. We're also looking, as you all well know, an intra-European fight, right? When I was in Budapest recently, I was struck by what, met, what the conversations I had with the French and the Germans versus the Norwegians versus the Americans. And they were all very different in terms of how to engage this shift in the liberal order and sort of how do you engage this creeping or growing authoritarianism. So there's a lot of work to do, not just transatlantic, but US individual nations and governments as well as people to people. I, we're going to be a very boring panel because we're all going to agree with each other. Um, but I, I mean, I, I agree with with everything both of them had said. I would just underscore a, a couple things. One, as as somebody who's worked a lot on on Turkey, uh, I've I've long been a believer in in what Sarah articulated, which is that relationships are ultimately between countries and not simply their leaders. And you have large percentages of populations in countries that don't necessarily agree with the direction that that countries are going. Uh, I've also been struck in having conversations with EU officials who have used some of the same talking points in thinking about relations with the US that I have used in talking points about Turkey. Uh, this idea that we're going to cooperate where we can, we're going to be frank about our differences, and we're going to continue to adhere to our own values. Uh, and it was somewhat jarring to have an EU official use my own talking points on Turkey uh, against me in, in the way that they are, are approaching the, the United States. Uh, I don't agree that, that things are going to be able to snap back to how they, they were before. I first started I, just, I don't think that's possible. I think the world has, has changed, both in the United States and in, in Europe. And I think the thing that Donald Trump has done that has been the most corrosive is to question and undermine the trust in the transatlantic relationship. And the analogy I often use when I talk about this is, you know, the young couple that thinks they're going to be together forever, uh, they break up and then they get back together again. But things are never the same when you get back together because there's this awareness that your love is not necessarily infallible, that you broke up once and that opens up the possibility that you could break up again. Uh, and my fear for, for Europeans is that this idea that the United States was always going to be the strong and loyal ally, as the U.S. has been in the post-war period, uh, has been questioned by Trump when he's raised questions about American commitment to Article 5, whether the U.S. would defend Montenegro, whether the U.S. would defend countries that haven't met defense spending commitments, is, is very damaging. It's, it's damaging in terms of NATO's ability to serve as a deterrent, uh, and it's also very damaging to the trust that's, that's underpinning the, the relationship. Uh, additionally, I think as, as Ben and Sarah had alluded to, you have a lot of, of, of tensions within Europe. Uh, you know, we're already seeing some challenges in Hungary and in Poland, uh, and there's some other European countries with, with uh, populist leaders, and, and we've been sort of one bad election away from, from more direct challenges within some of these European countries. Uh, for example, in, in the UK, lots of focus right now on, on leadership contests. Uh, if we end up with, with Jeremy Corbyn, for example, in the UK and Donald Trump in the US, I think the clash of personalities and worldviews between the two of those is going to be quite detrimental to what has long been a, a special relationship between those two countries. So certainly there are challenges coming out of the US side, but we're also having a lot of challenges within Europe in terms of a, a lack of, of leaders in some countries who are similarly prepared to defend the, the transatlantic relationship. Uh, the final thing I'll, I'll say is I don't think it's, it's a, a given that Donald Trump is, is going to lose. I think there's a decent chance that Trump is going to get reelected in, in two years. And my sense is that the attitude of a lot of the Europeans is that uh, things have been bad. They haven't necessarily been as bad as we feared. And so there really is a sense that, that everybody's going to hold on for the next 18 months, uh, hope that Donald Trump loses, and that this whole American national nightmare is just going to be a big aberration, and, and we're going to be able to move on. Uh, I think Donald Trump was very effective at identifying a lot of the frustrations that American people had. Uh, I don't think he has the right policy solutions, but I think he did tap into sentiments of, of people who were either feeling uh, economically left behind, concerns about migrants, uh, similar concerns to, to what people have here. Uh, and I don't think that, that Europeans have a, a good plan B. Uh, I don't think a lot of us, probably even sitting on the stage, have a good plan B as, as to what we're going to do if, if Trump gets reelected. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of these debates emerging in, in Europe with questions about strategic autonomy. Uh, but again, I think a lot of these divisions within Europe that we've seen with the financial crisis with the migration crisis, 
are raising real questions about whether or not Europe has the political will, uh, not to mention the capability to develop some of these more autonomous uh, capabilities. Also questions about which way Europe is likely to look to align itself if it continues to feel that the United States is not going to be a reliable partner in the long term. Jake, maybe you can just uh, speak a little bit about you know, what the campaign's um, view on um, different candidates view on Europe and transatlantic alliance and it, it's fascinating to see the it, the antibodies that have come out in the in the political process because Donald Trump has taken such a harsh view of alliances because he's basically determined that alliances that, that America's allies are more burden than benefit um, the reaction has been quite vigorous and fierce virtually every candidate running for president not to mention the leadership on the Democratic side in both the House and the Senate who are putting forward resolutions as, as the new Democratic-led House did to reinforce a long-standing commitment to NATO, are talking in terms of a community of like-minded states much along the lines of what Ben laid out. So whether you're talking about Bernie Sanders um, and his speech at Johns Hopkins in which he speaks of an axis of authoritarianism in the world that needs to be met by uh, like-minded allies starting with the transatlantic partnership or you're talking about Joe Biden actually showing up in Munich and doing what he did or Pete Buttigieg who just gave his speech in Indiana virtually everyone is putting forward a theory of the case very similar to what you just heard from Ben which is that American foreign policy going forward as we look at the range of challenges we face has to start from a foundation of reinvigorated and reinforced alliances I think Amanda has given very useful cautions and correctives about the possibility that Trump's reelected, some of the deeper trends in the United States. But I would say this, it's, it's notoriously difficult to poll the American people on attitudes towards foreign policy because you can ask them sort of the question in one way and they'll say, yeah, that makes sense. And then I ask them the question the opposite way and they'll say, yeah, that makes sense. But I, I think the general view that the United States is looked at differently and more negatively on the world stage today is something that bothers the American people. And it will be a factor in this election, quite apart from the issues. This idea that we are alone, that we're fighting with everybody, friends and foes alike, that um, we have lost some moral authority, um, this is something that is not maybe the, the top issue people vote on, but it is there, it is present, and it will be very much reinforced by whoever the Democratic nominee is. And the question for me, just coming back to the beginning of what Ben said, that you know you can't just come back in and say, okay, it's all gonna go back to normal, and, and Amanda echoed that. I totally agree with that point. However, at the same time, I think in terms of the long-term trend lines of where the attitudes of the American people are on some of these big questions of values and vision around migration or climate or what have you, I have more confidence maybe than what is normally in the commentary. That's gonna have to be proven out over time, but I'm not someone who believes um, that if a Democrat wins in 2021, in 2025 we're gonna end up with a Donald Trump 2.0. It's possible, it's certainly possible. But I think there are some things unique to this guy when it comes to American foreign policy that aren't even reflected across the broader Republican establishment. And that if a Nikki Haley or a Mike Pompeo, you know, who have their own challenges from my perspective, were the standard bearer in, in, in five or six years, you'd be having a different debate. So I, 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 I would just like to sound a little bit of a note of optimism, even on the Republican side, for notions around the transatlantic uh, relationship. Some things are structural in the United States, but some things are about the particular occupant of the Oval Office right now. But, it, but it's interesting the point you make about um, you know, America standing in the world and the American people um, you know, being sensitive on that. This was something that Barack Obama was very good at communicating um, and partly helped him win the election. But, I've seen a lack of a willingness to do this and even discuss this with some of the, you know, the main uh, contenders, even in the, you know, even in the general, where they don't really want to talk about, you know, foreign policy um, in this way. And I, you know, I feel it's just so it's kind of, you know, low, low hanging fruit, and it's and it's rather, I don't know, it's a Democrat. I just find it rather unfortunate. But well, Ben should speak to this because I think Alex, you're exactly right that that the core critique that that 
Barack Obama made against George Bush was, well, let's say in the Iraq war, but more fundamental was, what's our vision of America's role in the world and aren't you bothered about the question of respect and isolation and the like? Um, you, you're also right, but I think this is about a phase in the primary process right now where people feel their first obligation is to put points on the board on a range of domestic issues, heading into the first debate where the main questions will be around health care and the economy and the like. But I predict to you that whoever emerges um, as the standard bearer is going to marry an argument about who America is as a country domestically, which will be a core part of their argument against Trump, with who America is as a country internationally, and that the case against Trump will be prosecuted in part on the notion that um, we stand for something, represent something, have to re, you know capture something anew, um, and uh, you know that will come in different flavors depending on who the nominee is. But I th I expect that you are actually going to hear this argument start to gain some momentum as the as the primary process evolves, and then as we head into the general election. Yeah, I just I'd add. Um at the risk of, because uh, I agree with Jake on polls, but uh, the organization that, that, that Jake and I co-chaired recently commissioned a poll, and, and really the two things that, that resonate the most with voters in, our, in terms of arguments against Trump and his foreign policy, one is just the personal characteristics. He's reckless and he's impulsive, and, and that, that is dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous in risking a war. It's dangerous in how this trade war with China is going. But the other is the fundamentally undemocratic approach he's taken. He turns his back on our allies, he cozies up to dictators, and he doesn't represent our values. And that combined with this sense that America is kind of an embarrassment and we're isolated, I think is a very potent argument. In 2008, you know, this was Obama's core message. Yes, it was about Iraq, but it was also about restoring a sense of America being respected around the world. That was very resonant part of our message. It was in every speech he gave in that campaign. Um, and, it, and it did break through, as, as Jake said, this intangible sense that we're not respected or, or that we're even an embarrassment is something that Americans, they get this. They see it on the news. They see it when Trump travels abroad. And it's not tied to any specific policy. It's tied to this general feeling that this is not how we want to present ourselves and be represented. And sure, there's a very virulent base of Trumps that supports everything he does and believes everything he says. That has a lot to do with the structural dynamic in the Republican Party and right-wing media, and that's a whole other conversation. I, I think it's a mistake, and I, I sense this sometimes when I come to Europe, for people to look at you know, the worst panel on Fox News and think that's all of, 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 of half of America. Um, you know, keep in mind, Donald Trump got less votes for president than Mitt Romney got in 2012, and Barack Obama beat Mitt Rom Rom Romney handily. There hasn't been a massive shift. There's been a massive shift within the, the Republican Party. The other thing that's important that Jake alluded to, and, and we've made this point to a number of campaigns, is there is a connectivity to draw, not just between domestic bread and butter issues, but domestic small d democratic issues. A lot of what you see the Democrats focused on, the first bill that was introduced in the Democratic House, the, the initial proposals from people like Pete Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren and Beto O'Rourke dealt with dealing with American democracy at home. How are we protecting voting rights in the United States? How are we combating corruption in the United States? We don't look particularly good on the democracy authoritarian spectrum right now. And I think what there's an opportunity for Democrats to do is tie that business of getting our democracy in order at home to the example that we want to set abroad and to our foreign policy abroad. There's a direct correlation between whether we're protecting people's right to vote in the United States and whether we're advocating for that in other countries, whether we're respecting the independence of the free press in the United States and whether we're supporting journalists around the world instead of turning a blind eye to a country that chops up a, a journalist in a consulate in Turkey. So I think there's an opportunity for Democrats to take this a lot of energy in, in, in the activist base of the party around democratic reforms in the United States, anti-corruption and voting initiatives and the like, and connecting that to a story about how we're going to represent those values around the world again. I just wanted to add two things, because I think, sort of, Jake, your point about putting uh, the domestic issues on the board are really, really important, right? That's what Americans need to hear. How are you going to fix us at home? Why should I vote for you? But there's two important issues 
that I think are quite local and increasingly local that also resonate globally and require a multilateral solution, and those are climate change and immigration. And one of the things we've seen, and we've been reporting at this at Human, on, at Human Rights Watch on immigration, is that it's not just the border issue, which is a complete mess and really has been securitized. I think that's a good way to put it. But in fact, what we're seeing is, is detention uh, and deportation of long-standing immigrants in the United States who may not be there legally, but who have committed, who have contributed very constructively and built strong, important lives as bulwarks of their society in small communities throughout the middle of America. This touches the lives of Americans in very different ways than they've ever seen before. And so it helps them to understand not just what the federal government can come in and do in a nefarious way, but it also links to what's happening overseas or at the border. And so in order to address the immigration solution, which in their mind is taking away the guy who runs their favorite restaurant and taking them away from his family, it also links to what's happening on the border, it links to what's happening in Central America. It makes an easier case to, to multilateralize how we have to respond. Now, one answer to that is rejoining the migration compact that Trump pulled out of, but there's other ways to address this issue. And as we've tried to figure out, or the Democratic Party tries to figure out, you know, what the proper response is to so many people coming, trying to come across the border, everybody knows that detaining children and separating them for fam from families is not the answer. But what can, how can we work with U.S. allies to do this in a more humane way? That's a question I think that the Democrats can really seize on and globalize. And climate change is the other one. As hurricanes and tornadoes and floods sweep across the middle of the United States, this again is a question. It's not just about the Paris Agreement, but rejoining the Paris Agreement is obviously easy. But who's losing out with all of this climate change? It's the most vulnerable people, not just in America, but globally. And so what can the Democratic candidates do? What options can they suggest that support these communities and then link those vulnerable communities in response to those around the world who are suffering in the same ways. Thanks for bringing up climate change. Actually, uh, I wanted to pivot to Asia, but I think the climate change um, discussion is, is interesting. I mean, one thing that you know we've seen in the ECFR, uh, you know, uh, data obviously is you know how important climate change is uh, to the European uh, population, um, and that um, you know large majorities in a lot of country would countries would actually sacrifice um, for it. The more that you were you know, um, cared about climate change, the more likely you were to vote. And uh, the same is, is true um, for the Democratic base in the US. And actually now more and more Republicans um, are believing uh, that climate change is actually uh, real um, than, uh, than ever before. Um, and so is this, I mean, a possible, uh, you know, entry point for a new transatlantic um, alliance, um, new forms of multilateralism? I mean, the uh, climate change uh, manifestos of each candidate, which have been, you know, impacted by the New Deal, are they, you know, a bridge uh, to the rest of the world? You guys see it that way? Well, to varying degrees, they're explicitly about how the United States, which, uh, you know, obviously needs to work with the rest of the world to deal with this problem, does its part and then connects to first like-minded countries and then to the world more generally. I think the big challenge that Democrats are struggling with on climate change is that um, if a Democrat is elected in 2020, uh, they will, as Ben mentioned before, they will either have a Republican Senate or they will have a Democratic Senate by one vote which is going to make it very difficult to drive through the kinds of regulatory changes on climate that are necessary uh, or that are scoped to the, to the size of the problem. So what I think Democrats are going to end up doing is thinking about public investment in infrastructure and scientific research, which is something that probably can get bipartisan support, and then thinking, okay, how do we smuggle in as much climate stuff to that as possible? So that, and then doing a whole lot by regulatory action, uh, the way that President Obama did. But this is going to put an enormous amount of energy then for a Democratic president into, because there's only so much that they can do at home, into wanting to work with the rest of the world on this problem. So I think the United States is going to immediately reach back out to Europe if a Democrat is elected. And I don't know there will be an issue higher than climate on the agenda in terms of not just re-entering Paris, but... Um, you know, taking it to the next level through ambition ratchet, but also thinking about what the next uh, the, the next set of actions that are required um, on the docket. So let's uh, pivot to Asia now. Um, you know, uh, I um, 
I had another dinner, so I wasn't able to, to come to the dinner last night, but I heard there were some very interesting remarks um, about, about China. Um, and, um, you know, my father also made some, uh, you know, interesting remarks about um, a bipartisan consensus. Um, you know, it's interesting when, you know, when we go into meetings, you know, with Democratic leadership, it seems that the difference on China, besides the fact that, you know, Schumer, uh, you know, is harder on China than Trump and, you know, prides himself on this since, you know, the 90s. Um, and, you know, the Democrats are actually, you know, outflanking him on this a bit and making it hard for him to, to actually make that uh, trade deal is the fact that, you know, they say we would work with the Europeans to defeat China um, and uh, Trump doesn't. Um, so is there really bipartisan consensus on China given, you know, where the American people are at and also are we, in a weird way, headed towards um, a new, you know, a new Cold War almost, um, uh, you know, with China? I mean, it may not, you know, the word cold may refer to trade or to other things, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are seeing things um, in this, um, you know, in this uh, paradigm. I mean, I, I think that the, the bipartisan consensus that governed American China policy for, since Richard Nixon, uh, there's a, a collective view that that was wrong, you know, that, that liberalizing the economy in China would lead to political liberalization and to China being a better actor. I think there was uh, certainly a consensus in the Democratic Party that the time had come to be more confrontation, confrontational towards China. I think President Obama would have been himself if we weren't in a financial crisis in the first several years of his administration and needed China to get out of that. Uh, hardly the time to uh, start a trade war. And that actually what we had been trying to do is set the table for the confrontation with China. And so you get TPP in place in the Asia Pacific, you have a much more solid platform to work with other countries to then confront and try to pressure China. I think that the Democratic Party, I'll amend what I said earlier, the issue in which I see the, the least cohesion in terms of putting forward an alternative is on this issue related to trade in China, right? Um, people, have had a feeling that we needed to get tough on China for some time, but they often didn't really articulate that. The debate around TPP was rather disappointing to me and our party because here we're trying to give ourselves a tool to do that and, and, and we didn't get a lot of support. And so right now it's pretty fluid because people are beginning to criticize Trump's trade war because they can see the repercussions in terms of higher prices and the impact on farmers, um, but they, they haven't, figured out where that criticism leads in terms of a coherent uh, critique. I think where it's likely to go is essentially a policy that says, yes, we are in a competition with China. Um, but what does that mean? Number one, as Jake has alluded to, that means we need to do much more investment in the kinds of elements at home that can sustain us in a long-term competition. Basic research and innovation, not getting beat on, on new technologies, a more deliberate conversation with our tech companies about AI. I think there will be a piece of the Democratic Party approach to this that focuses on, okay, how can we deal with this at home? Um, I then I think there will be certainly rhetoric and I think hopefully it leads to policies around how do we work collectively with other countries, Europe, but also countries in the Asia Pacific to address what we see is some of China's unfair trade practices. So in other words, rather than making this some bilateral you know, test of strength, mano a mano, us versus Xi Jinping, multilateralizing the trade discussion to deal with some of the core irritants that we have with China. Because the reality is I actually don't think that we can necessarily sustain this kind of bilateral trade war uh, given our politics in the United States. It's easier for the Chinese to squeeze a part of our economy and force a response than uh, than it is, uh, it's easier for them to do that to us than for us to do that to them um, without uh, pulling down the whole global economy with us. Um, so I think the Democrats will be talking about multilateralizing, addressing Chinese uh, trade irritants. I think the tech issue is almost a separate issue. That was building when we were in office. And that reflects not just Trump's orientation, but deep-seated feelings among the US national security establishment, the intelligence community, the military, uh, uh, concerns around the supply chain. I do think that at a certain point, reality has to be brought in this discussion, and the idea that you're going to completely bifurcate and separate out a, an American and Chinese supply chain is not practical, uh, and so there's going to have to be a dose of reality to this, and I think Democrats would be less likely to put uh, our allies in the position where we're going around the world and forcing everybody to choose, but I do think you'll see 
efforts to try to decouple the most important elements of what we see as uh, uh, national security threats with respect to, to the supply chain. The last piece is we should be bringing values into this discussion, right? Um, and this is something that has been missing. I think that the, we need to be much more forceful in talking about what is happening in Western China with a million Uyghurs uh, in concentration camps, in talking about what uh, has happened recently in Hong Kong. And yes, it makes the Chinese uncomfortable, but the fact that it makes them uncomfortable demonstrates that they don't want you to do it, demonstrates that it's a source of leverage. And, and so for the United States to, 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 to have a full toolkit in terms of how it's approaching this challenge from China, it's gonna have to mean rejoining the Human Rights Council, rejoining the discussion on human rights, and bringing this into the conversation again, even though it's gonna make for some awkward exchanges with the Chinese. Um, and, and so I'd like to see Democrats do that. I, I haven't seen them do that, though, so this may just, that may just be my view. Sir, uh, sir, I think you're the best qualified to speak on this <laughs> issue. So I actually think it's, it's really dangerous to separate trade out from the rest of how the U.S. engages on China, and that's historically, it's been separate. I understand it's very complicated. I do think Europe has an important role to play here, but what we are seeing in China is not just a million plus Uyghurs in internment camps, but it is really an effort to completely control stifle dissent. Some call it a totalitarian effort, but the problem is it's not just happening in China, which you all probably know, and why so many people are concerned. It's being exported. It's being exported to Ecuador, to Kenya. I think in the last 18 months, we've seen 13 different countries who have purchased and been tra purchased Chinese software and been trained by the Chinese on various ways of, uh, of, of surveilling uh, their populations. And the reason this is so concerning, because it is a giant national security threat, not just for the United States, but for so many US allies, particularly those that have weaker institutions. And interestingly, what I have seen over the years in working on China uh, in Washington is that as the Republicans who tend to be much stronger in linking the two together and Republicans who really push on human rights concerns. Now this I think has to do with sort of the old communist boogeyman that is still out there and they're ready to go after China, you know, at all costs and they include uh, human rights and rule of law concerns. But under President Xi, things have gotten so much more uh, restrictive and I think you know, the Democratic candidates really need to be linking these issues together because it I mean, we talked about political interference in the last election from Russia quite a bit, but I think what we're looking at now is an open playing field when it comes to China. I've been, as I've been driving around Lisbon, I've noticed all the Huawei signs, and I just sort of think, whew, you know, like, this obviously has a role, there's a role here for Europe as well. Where is your data going? Where is your information going? And how does that play out in the trade conversation? These are not separable, separable in the way that they used to be, and I, I think it would be good for all of the Democratic candidates, whether it's 24, 25, of them or 10 of them uh, you know, in the coming months to start looking at this in a comprehensive way. So it's not just raising the question of values in your trade conversation as the last bullet point if you get time in the meeting, but it's actually putting them together and saying, yes, we're going to have a human rights dialogue. We've done that in the past, but we're going to bring the trade issues into that conversation. Because one of the things I, I do think that the TPP started to do that we'd sort of never seen before on trade issues was it brought really comprehensive, innovative labor provisions into certain parts of the agreement that Human Rights Watch did not take a position on the TPP as an, as an entity, but we did really support some of those provisions, particularly with Vietnam, and what we knew was that those, gover those labor unions, if <laughs> they were allowed to form, wanted to see those, that support because they wanted to use that as a pushback against China, and so there's a real, there's a comprehensive approach here that actually benefits the United States in a much more holistic way. And yes, it's innovative, and yes, it's different, but it's not just about you know, the incubator of Xinjiang and the 1.2 million people who are being surveilled and thrown in camps because they go out the back door instead of the front door, or they're talking to the wrong people, you know, or they seem subversive because they have a family member overseas. It's much bigger than that, and it really impacts all of these pieces. And so if the Republicans are gonna keep pushing on that, the door is actually open for the Democratic candidates to to, to reclaim that space or to claim that space with them and make that bipartisan push, which is ultimately, given that we've talked about the Senate, the only way we're gonna sort of move on both these issues. I just, I wanted to pick up on the, the end of what Sarah said and say a word about the, the European component here, because I, I do believe that this is an area where the United States and the EU could cooperate. And I think the thing that's unfortunate is we are seeing Europe starting to move closer to some of the American perspective on China. And I sense that there is a willingness in, in Europe to engage. Uh, but unfortunately, this is something that the Trump administration has largely wanted to handle on a bilateral basis and has not been as 
receptive, as far as I've seen, to, to European interest in, in cooperating. Uh, I think there has been concern about uh, China in the United States for a number of years. This is something that has not hugely been shared uh, in Europe until the, the last couple of years. Uh, similarly to, to Sarah, I've also been struck by the, you know, seeing Huawei signs, uh, speaking with people here in Portugal, uh, you know, hearing that the, the Troika had encouraged uh, the Portuguese government as part of the financial crisis to uh, privatize some of their national industries, which you ended up having Chinese firms purchasing. Uh, and you've had a huge amount of, of Chinese investment across Europe, including focusing on the literal states uh, and those in, in Southern Europe that were needing to have injections of cash during the financial crisis that weren't coming from the United States, that weren't coming from elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and so you end up having Chinese firms owning a, a large amount of critical infrastructure in Europe, which is something that uh, Europeans, I think, until more recently have not seen as, as big of a, a potential medium to long-term security threat as, as the, the Americans have. Uh, the one point I'll, I'll say, and it's something that I hear a lot in, in Europe, it's something I've, I've heard already this week, uh, is a lot of criticism of Obama's pivot to Asia. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of Europeans interpreted this as the United States withdrawing from Europe uh, and wanting to, to refocus. And part of this, I think, was a recognition of the rising China, the need for the United States to deal with that. John Mearsheimer talking quite uh, dramatically last night about the need for the, the United States to, to reposition an element of its, its military forces to, to deal with that perceived threat. Uh, I think in an ideal world, a sense in the United States has been that there has been a huge amount of American investment in Europe since the end of the Cold War. We brought Central and Eastern Europe into uh, the European Union, into NATO, a sense that, that Europe should be in a position to be able to be a security provider rather than a security consumer. And in an ideal in the ideal world, we would have Europe providing a greater amount of security for itself and for its immediate neighborhood, and then being able to pivot with the United States to Asia. Uh, and I think certainly in the first term of the Obama administration, there were efforts to try and do that. Uh, I was in the State Department at the time this policy was rolled out, and so certainly heard a lot of European concern at the time. Uh, the Assistant Secretary for Asia in the State Department was holding monthly meetings with uh, European ambassadors. So it was the policy official focused on Asia meeting with the European leaders. Uh, in 2012, Hillary Clinton and Kathy Ashton made a trip to Phnom Penh. They did a lot of work on Burma. Uh, so there really was an effort at that time, uh, partly, I think, to provide reassurance partly also to provide the broader point that Asia was something that, that we should be working on collectively. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that that started to wane a bit and, and now within this current administration, uh, there's not the same interest and desire in cooperating with Europe. But with a lot of us trying to look at a positive agenda, especially if you have a democratic president coming in, uh, China and broader Asia questions should be a very natural place for the United States and the European Union to cooperate. Thank you for highlighting that point um, about the uh, Obama's pivot perhaps being the, um, you know, such a ground for, for a different transatlantic alliance. It's something I constantly hear uh, in European capitals that this, you know, what we're seeing now is started under, uh, you know, under Obama and that he didn't care about Europe. Um, you know, he wasn't interested in Europe. Um, and as, you know, I, I mean, People can disagree, but it's you know it's something that that we you know is, has lasted to this day. Yeah, I, I, I get this all the time. Um, and, and look, the, I, it, it was not a. I mean, what I always start by saying is what we meant is we were pivoting away from the wars in the Middle East, not from Europe, <laughs> and it was heard that way. Um, but look, the reality is all of Obama's closest partnerships were in Europe. Uh, every major initiative we had in the world had Europe as a core partner in it. And 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 yes, there is an accurate point that Trump and Obama have made similar diagnoses about both American foreign policy and the direction of the world. That the, the, the resource expenditure in the Middle East, particularly in the wars, was unsustainable. That there needs to be more burden sharing in the world. Uh, and frankly, a recognition that the, the power dynamic is changing and the hegemonic moment of the post-Cold War era was going to end. However, their answers for how to deal with that were diametrically opposed. Um, Obama uh, was trying to manage a transition to a more multipolar world by making the United States more engaged diplomatically in the world, by spreading our engagement uh, to include not just Asia Pacific, but also Africa and Latin America. So Obama's diagnosis was more multilateralism, more cooperation, enlisting Europe as a core partner in everything that we were doing around the world, while Trump's approach is to see those same problems and to pull back and essentially have an isolationist policy 
mixed in with some belligerence whenever he has a particular interest. So I think it's very important for Europeans to understand, just because Obama and Trump made some similar critiques of how the world had been operating over the last decade or two, they had completely different diagnoses for those, uh, the, those critiques, and Europe was central to the more multilateral world that Obama was seeking to build. So just let's get dark here with Trump um, uh, and talk about him uh, winning a re-election and how bad things uh, could, um, you know, could possibly get where he's not you know, restrained by a re-election, even though maybe he you know, can find some ways of going for a third term, who knows. Uh, but um, um, but you know, um, what do you guys think about a, you know, a second Trump presidency and you know, would the gloves be off? Would he be able to stop being a chicken hawk and be a real hawk? Um, or, or is what we're seeing what we get right now uh, with Trump? I mean, how, you know, where, where would we be in 2024 if, uh, if, there's a, if Trump's still president and uh, not impeached? I think the important thing for all of us to understand about Donald Trump is that while he is a basket of sort of grievances and instincts and impulses, he has had very consistent views on American foreign policy going back 30 plus years. I don't think they involve him going around starting a lot of wars. He's, he, he, generally speaking, is not that interested in the actual use of American military force. But it does mean at least two things. Number one, um, shedding what he views as the burden of alliances. There was just a story in Reuters yesterday about how he's amusing once again about ending the US-Japan alliance. Um, after you know, learning that it was a Japanese tanker coming through the, the Straits of Hormuz that got hit, and why aren't the Japanese here defending it? Why are we defending it for them? So I think that his desire to follow through on his instincts on NATO, um, the transatlantic partnership, and our trans-Pacific alliances, he, he likely would follow through on that in a second term, at least to a much greater extent than he has. And the second is, he believes the multilateral trading system fundamentally harms the United States of America. He'd like to get out of the WTO. He'd like to bilateralize every trade agreement, including doing separate trade agreements with the member states of the European Union one by one. And he would look for ways to drive wedges to be able to do that. Um, and then finally, on issues from climate to migration to uh, nuclear proliferation, both he and the people around him, I think, have fundamentally deconstructive instincts, how to break down the modes and architecture of cooperation around those transnational issues. So I think it could get quite challenging. Um, and then, of course, there's the China issue, which I think, regardless of who's president, we are going to have a... Um, a much more competitive, uh, much more challenging relationship with China. But it will, I, I think the difference between a Democrat getting elected and Trump getting elected, as everyone on the stage has said, is fundamentally the difference between the United States trying to work particularly with our allies and partners to deal with that challenge and Trump just doing it. And that is a place where I think you could see competition turn into confrontation or conflict. Anybody have a more gloomy view, perhaps? I, I, I have a little bit. I mean, I think domestically we're in for it if he wins again. I think the gloves are off completely domestically, which will have foreign policy implications um, in, in, in a lot of ways. But I also think that the politicization... So let me back up for a second. I mean, I often am struck by the cruelty of this administration. At the end of every policy decision that is made, are people, and very rarely, if ever, does this administration seem to consider how policy decisions impact people. And every decision has to make, every administration has to make a trade-off when they make policy decisions. They have to decide we're gonna go forward with it, even if it has negative conse consequences for humans, for individuals. But this administration doesn't even seem to, to consider what the impact is, and, and we see in many places, I mean, I think Yemen, and much of the Middle East is a really good example, but Yemen in particular, where you see a growing anti-American sentiment that was there 
uh, even in, in the beginning of the war under the Obama administration, and it was seen very much as the U.S. war, not the Saudi-led coalition war, even at that time. But now it, is, it has grown significantly. And so I think there's a lot of potential threats for that, that lack of consideration for the harm that the administration is doing. But the manipulation, manipulation and politicization of norms and standards uh, to, to suit their geopolitical goals is really problematic. We talked yesterday... Uh, on and off about the international order at dinner. John Mearsheim talked about sort of where the international order was. And I think, you know, as I watch the president suddenly care so much for the people of Iran, right, or, or the Venezuelan people, but take these hardline positions that are actually making their lives much worse. If you look at the impact the sanctions are having on the health sector in Iran, or you look at the impact of sanctions on Venezuela in many cases, or the travel ban, right, on Iranians who want to come to the United States, there's, there's no consideration of, of what the U.S. is doing. And I think we'll see that kind of hardline approach and at, the, and at the end of the day, literally, when Americans go home, if they haven't thought about the impact of their policies at all on people, we're looking not just at a cleanup job for the next administration, whether it's Democratic administration, but we're looking at a real strain in alliances in a new way. And I, I worry greatly about what that means. It also, frankly, makes the job of Congress much more difficult because Congress, in a sense, does represent the American voices in a different way than the, the administration does. And we've seen an effort to, to move the ball from the House. And I think even in the Senate, despite the differences, um, that they've tried to move a number of issues and step in uh, where the administration has backed off or even made some harmful decisions. So I have real concern about some of the structures, about, about sort of U.S. leadership. And we have seen in certain instances, Ben, you mentioned the Human Rights Council. I don't want the U.S. to go back to the Human Rights Council right now. I frankly think they'd be more damaging or equally as damaging as Saudi or the Democratic Republic of Congo sitting on that council. But I do hope to see, in the absence of the U.S., other governments stepping up, up to the plate and beginning to create the alliances to push forward on a number of issues where U.S. leadership had traditionally been. That's going to have to happen a lot more if there's another Trump administration. And we haven't seen a sustained effort in that direction yet. So would you I would just I, I add a, a couple things, and I completely agree with them. One, I think I have relevance to, to Europe is, is going to be to watch what Trump does on, on NATO. Uh, I mean, I don't think that Trump is going to unilaterally withdraw the United States from NATO. I think it's very clear that Congress would oppose that. But there's plenty of things he can do to undermine it. He's already started to do that with some of his comments on Article 5. There were stories circulating earlier this year about him wanting to give bills to European countries that were housing American military bases. Uh, so so there's plenty of things that he can do to continue to undermine trust in, in the alliance. Second, so far we haven't had to see the Trump administration really deal with any external crises that aren't of their own making. Uh, we haven't had a 9-11, we haven't had an Ebola, uh, and given a lot of the chaos within the administration, it's very unclear uh, how the administration would respond to that. And as we have seen with Trump's handling of, of Iran in recent days with ordering strike and pulling back strikes, there's a real risk, I think, of strategic miscalculation on the part of, of others in, in response to this. Uh, third, I think that, that Trump is, has the potential to have a, a negative long-term impact on American thinking on things. If you see some opinion polls, there, are, there is greater questioning now of, of why is the U.S. defending Montenegro? What is the importance of the alliance? So I think this, this rhetoric can also be corrosive on, on American public opinion, uh, and certainly it's corrosive on public opinion in, in Europe and in other allied countries when they see the way that they are being treated by the American president. Uh, finally, I would pick up on the point that, that Sarah was making, which is the strain that this is going to put on American institutions long term. Uh, so far, I think we have seen the resilience of American institutions. We have seen Congress push back on things. We have seen the press push back on things. Uh, we've seen a, a surge in support. Um, Within grassroots organizations, we had a record number of women running for elected office in, in the last election. Uh, but it's it's exhausting. And I think we've seen this in, in other countries, uh, you know, Turkey, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, to, to take uh, but a few examples where people have, have seen their, their governments moving in, in more authoritarian directions, institutions trying to, to fight. Uh, we've already seen Trump put two justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and others are, are getting older 
So in a second uh, Trump term, it is possible that Trump would be appointing at least a third, if not more, justices to the Supreme Court, which ends up having long-term implications for American domestic politics as well. Um, I think I'm going to have to be authoritarian here uh, and end this panel uh, because um, we have uh, um, some breakout sessions uh, to happen. But um, I really want to thank um, our panelists for traveling um, to Lisbon. Um, and also, we're going to have a very um, interesting afternoon, which I hope many of you will, will come to on uh, you know, what are the ways that we can rebuild a, a, trans, a transatlantic um, alliance. I think that you got a lot of, uh, you know, Twitter material perhaps from what people have said from uh, Sarah's point about uh, equating the U.S. to the DRC. Uh, and um, and I um, am still uh, reeling uh, from Amanda's point about um, getting back together with ex-lovers and uh, girlfriends, and um, I don't think I ever will now. Uh, so um, so um, thank you for that. Um, so I think we go, I think there's going to be a, a speaker, and then uh, we go to, uh, to the breakout uh, sessions. But thank you again uh, for being here, and I hope you guys come this afternoon.